Out here protesting Judge Larris Young, who has legally kidnapped, who has been legally kidnapping people's children. Um, she doesn't abide by the law; just her conclusions of the law. And we have been trying to bring awareness. And right now, she's currently under investigation by the JCB. Judge Young took my oldest daughter from me over false allegations. The um, allegations came back that they were false. But she still took my daughter, would not allow none of my witnesses or anybody to speak, even a social worker that's in my house twice a week. And over top of that, you know, DHS takes my daughter, but gives me three other kids. Um, took my niece and um, said it was temporary and never returned her to our family. Um, did they ever reach out to the family? Yes, on April 15, 2016, they called me and said that my niece was going to be placed and I actually had her three brothers. So they told me they had to come to my house to check her brother. So when they got to my house, I said, where's my niece? And their first question was, um, she's with your cousin, isn't she? And she showed me a safety plan. And Ciola Bentley wrote on the safety plan, cousin. And I said, she's not my cousin. And what they told me is, oh, her placement is just temporary. Don't worry about it. Her house won't pass. Um, and it was, it was a Friday evening. And I'm like, these people, this is their job. So I believed them. Um, so I had her three brothers. And time went on. And, and every week, I would call them. And she went to another cool worker, and that cool worker um, stalled me, so, and then eventually told me I would be considered second after this non-relative. Okay, why are you here today? I'm here today fighting for three of my daughters. Um, they are 15, 14, and 12. Um, I had a caseworker from DHS come into my home back in September, on September 18th, uh, 2017. She came into my home very nasty, very unprofessional. She was a trainee, first of all, so I don't know how she was even allowed at my house by herself. She came into my home, said she didn't see no signs of abuse, no signs of neglect, but she did tell me that I need to, I need to beat my kids, but don't leave marks. So I did report her for that, and since I reported her for that, everything just went downhill from there. Go to Elijah Austin from me. So I'm fighting to get my daughter back. I want my baby to know that I'm fighting for her, I'm coming, and I'm not going to let them hold me down. Terminating rights. They out of control. This whole building. They just they just taking our rights away. We moms. Who was these people to tell us that somebody else could take care of our kids better than us? They are crazy. So yes, I'm out here so my mom can be heard, and I'm speaking for all these other moms as well, because it's not right. years old. I am a current youth advocate with Juvenile for Justice with the Juvenile Law Center. I am a sophomore in high school. I love to shop, dance, be my family and have fun. I have many plans for the college, for my future, including attending college for criminal justice, joining a SWAT team, becoming a lawyer, and advocate for youth, foster youth. This year, I started working as a youth advocate at Juvenile Law Center. I am part of the Achievement Independence Center. And I am getting support from my case manager and parents to stay active and seek out new hobbies. When I entered the delinquency system, I was only 13 years old. I, was, I am speaking here today to send a message to the parents and leaders of Philadelphia. My mother thought going to a juvenile holding facility would be good for me. She thought I would be safe. She didn't realize that I would be abused, strip searched, mistreated, or I wouldn't be able to continue my education. I hope that by me sharing my story today, parents and leaders will realize that youth are better off staying in their own homes. I am sharing some really hard things that happened to me because I don't want them to happen to other youth. I first went to, into placement in May of 2016 and was in two different facilities for total about seven months. First, I was at a lockdown, a lockdown placement in Philadelphia, and it was the worst. There was a lot of physical abuse happening in this facility. There was one staff person assigned to each floor, 
and the staff felt that they could do whatever they wanted to the youth. Staff fought girls and male staff restrained youth, female youth, which they didn't feel right to me. Staff also let you fight another youth by giving them permission to go off the site of the camp so they wouldn't be seen. I also heard about someone being pepper sprayed in response to telling a staff person no. I had witnessed one of my roommates shackled for days and afterwards she had black and blue marks everywhere. If I act out, they would put my hands behind my back and throw me on the floor. One time I refused to go to the main room and a staff person body slammed me. Then they put me in a small room with just one staff person about for a whole day. The room was in a boys hall and I had nothing to do in there. I had eaten around breakfast, but 9 a.m. to 3.30 p.m., I didn't, they didn't let me eat anything. Sometimes staff played favorites, and other youth would get multiple snacks or meals while I went hungry. The food was also unsafe. I found worms in my food a couple of times. There was no school at the facility we had to stay in one room all day. There was no teachers, no books, just a TV, and even that was on when a staff wanted to watch TV. There was nothing to do and I hated going there. Youth are strip searched in this, these facilities. For me, I didn't like being strip searched at all. I didn't want to see anybody, I didn't want, oh I'm sorry, I didn't want anybody to see me naked. It was very uncomfortable. When I was at the facility, at one point I had a, a seizure related to my medication. While I was in my hut getting ready to sleep, and my friend noticed that I was shaking and my eyes were rolling behind my back, rolling behind my head. So she notified the staff on the floor, but it took five to 10 minutes before anyone can help me. A man ended up coming, he wasn't even a nurse. All he did was offer me water. Another time, a staff intentionally burnt me with a flat iron while she was straightening my hair. Afterwards, I was in a lot of pain and asked to see a nurse, but she wasn't there because she was only part-time. I never got to see a doctor until I went to court four or five days later. By that time, it was all scarred up. When my judge saw what happened to me, she moved me to a different floor. I had to stay in the same facility because the other placements where I was supposed to go didn't have a bed available. Even though the, the, this facility is now closed, there are other juvenile delinquent centers where youth may be going through the same thing. It is hard for you to speak up about these things. When I was at the facility, I was too scared to open up and talk. I, think, I didn't think anyone would believe me. I didn't think anyone would, anything would be done if I ever did speak up. Why should I think anyone will help me as if they are sitting there harming me? Next, I was sent to a group home in the Poconos. In some ways, it was better than the first facility, but, in, but it was still really difficult for me. I miss my parents and family. I felt so lonely and I didn't, and like I didn't have, sorry, anyone who loved me. Not feeling that love and being away from home is the worst feeling. I can't even describe it. I wasn't allowed to have a home pass, so I couldn't even see my mother. Eventually, I heard that my family went to a trip to Wildwood, which was our annual tradition. That hit me hard, it made me feel like, realize how alone I felt. I couldn't take it anymore, and I, ran, I ended up running away so I could see them. Being in placement really messed up my life. I tried to go back to the charter school I attended for two years before going to the placement. But they wouldn't let me back in. I only had, um, my only option was to do a cyber program. I didn't learn anything while I was in placement. To this day, I still have trouble in school. I ended up having to take eighth grade classes, like pre-algebra that I should already have known. I also now had trust issues with adults. Going to placement changed the way I was. I was quiet, didn't want to be around anybody else. But at least once I, was home from placing it, I was getting all that love that I was missing for all those months. I wish I would just be able to stay home with my family the whole time. I'm speaking here for the youth that are delinquent and child welfare centers and going through what I've been through. I want to make a change and hope that everybody has realized 
that these centers are not the best for youth. Thank you so much for listening. Have a, have a nice afternoon. different mentality today, it seems hard, it seems challenging, it seems challenging. I don't say hard, because the only hard. thing hard is the concrete that we walk on, everything else is a challenge, else is a challenge. Um, um. so, so, I'm ready, I'm ready for this challenge, and I was built, and I was built for this, I think that, I think that we all have a purpose in life, and mine's and mine's is going to take on a test that most that most of uh, back away back from, away from that impossible, that impossible so people, people say it's impossible, impossible. I, see I see possibilities. I don't see anything, I don't see anything as being impossible. impossible.